Oui. Everyone okay? Everyone good? Yeah? Yes? <laughs> okay. If you like to make any changes to the program or whatever, it's always okay to make suggestions if it isn't quite right. So I hope, as long as you're happy, uh, yeah, reasonably happy, not, su not super happy, because if you were super happy, you'd probably you know, be meditating somewhere instead or something, yeah, but, uh, but at least reasonably happy, that's always good. Uh, yeah, you are at ease, comfortable, enjoying yourself, uh, that is what matters. Uh. So I will start off, I got a question, sorry, what, what is your name? Dave. Dave, okay, Dave, okay. Uh, Dave, Dave just asked the question about what is the, um, uh, the plane of neither, uh, non, neither perception or non-perception. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, this is really about the four immaterial attainments uh, in Buddhism. Uh, yeah? So you have the four jhanas, which are the uh, samasamadhi, and above that you have the four immaterial attainments, so that are even more profound states of samadhi. Uh, so this is where you go into samadhi that goes more and more profound. It's kind of moving towards cessation, which is the ending of everything, where everything stops. Uh, and that is called the sanya vidaita niroda, the ending of perception and feeling. Uh, so this is the highest attainment before everything ceases. Uh, and so, uh, and the attainment before that is called the attainment of nothingness, the plane of nothingness. Yeah. So, under Alara Kalama, he reaches nothingness, and then beyond that, uh, uh, because you already have got to nothing. Yeah? I don't know if you can imagine. You have an attainment of samadhi where you are one pointed, and all your experience is is nothingness. Uh, that's the experience. The experience is nothingness. Uh, it's kind of strange, isn't it? Uh, to imagine you can imagine like maybe infinite space or infinite consciousness. It sort of makes sense, but ex the experience of nothingness it starts to get very weird, uh, and this gets even weirder still because you are so peaceful, so calm. There is so little left that you don't really know whether you are perceiving anything or not. Uh, afterwards, when you come out, you, you know that something happened. You're not really sure what it was uh, because it is so completely different from any ordinary experience. Uh, yeah, and uh, so neither perception, non perception is kind of the, in the land between still being conscious and not being conscious. You're kind of, you are conscious, but it's almost as if you are not, not, not conscious anymore. Yeah? And it's this kind of land between there somewhere. And they say that that uh, experience cannot be used for insight uh, because you're actually not able to directly understand it because it is so subtle. So the last uh, experience you can use for insight is the perception of nothing, is the uh, plane of nothingness, uh, because that is where you have a clear perception, a clear consciousness. Here it is starting to fade away. Yeah. So it is a, the name is strange, and the attainment obviously is even more strange. Yeah. So and this is uh, this is the reason why it is so so different. Uh, you happy with that? Uh? Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. There is only one way, of course, to really understand these things. You have to actually get there. Uh, but uh, that's really the only way. Uh. <laughs> so. Good luck. And we <laughs> eventually, yeah, eventually we'll get there. This, this takes the commitment, that's all. Huh? <laughs> okay, so now we have uh, come to the point the Buddha has understood the problem with sensuality. Uh, and this is really the hard one to understand. This is uh, very uh, profound already to understand the shortcomings of sensuality fully is actually very difficult. Uh, and uh, the reason is because we all live our lives immersed in sensuality. From the moment you wake up in the morning till you lie down at night, everything is sensuality. The whole world around us is a sensual existence. The five senses is all we know, yeah, seeing, hearing, yeah. and it's all about getting those in a positive way in our life uh, so we can en enjoy our existence. So the idea of living without sensuality is almost, it's hard to imagine. Uh, because it means the five senses are turned off. What is left when the five senses are turned off? Well, our whole existence is so much involved with the five senses. It's almost impossible to even envisage what it might mean not to have any kind of sensuality. And this is why I, what I'm saying before, it's so important to remember that sensuality, when we talk about that, we don't just mean like the coarse desires for sensual pleasures. We actually mean our entire existence in the realm of the five senses. So that's why everything we do is really about sensuality pretty much, uh, except when you start to do some meditation practice. Uh, you start to give that up, you get, start to get some joy and happiness in your meditation. This is where you're starting to move out of that realm of sensuality. Uh. 
So this is already a very profound insight, and this is by by far the most difficult insight to have, yeah, uh, because uh, uh, it is so. We are really are moving into uncharted territory when you move out of the realm of sensuality. Uh, so now the Buddha to be. Uh, what he is still, still left with uh, is the problem of self-torment, uh, because he still hasn't understood that, uh, and that was quite clear from the way he was phrased in the previous one. He says that whether you experience pain or not, yeah, you can uh, experience awakening, but now, so now comes the period of self-torment. We know that the Buddha went through this period, uh, it is described in a number of suttas, uh, uh, but this is perhaps the most uh, original and most uh, relevant description, the one found in this particular sutta. So these are the practices the Buddha went through, and they are quite interesting in, in a couple of ways. So we'll have a look at that now. So the Buddha says, I thought, suppose with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrain, and crush mind with mind. This is like supreme willpower, using willpower yeah, to the max, to crush your own mind, to bend it in a certain way. Yeah. So, with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained, and crushed mind with mind. While I did so, sweat ran from my armpits, just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head or shoulders and beat him down, constrain him and crush him, so too with my teeth clenched and my tongue pressed against the roof of my mouth, I beat down, constrained, a crushed mind with mind, uh, and sweat ran from my armpits." So he's really giving it everything. He's using supreme maximum energy to control his own mind. This is mind control. This is willpower taking to the highest extent. Yeah, And uh, he doesn't get the, any results because he says, although tireless energy was aroused in me and my mindfulness was well established, unremitting just means that it is established all the time, uh, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. Yeah? But such painful feelings that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. So here, this is just saying really that in a very extreme sense that using willpower is not really, uh, is not really going to work. At least not in its own right, yeah, as a path to awakening. The Buddha is here using it as a path to gain enlightenment and it just doesn't lead you anywhere. You cannot uh, suppress the defilements and then get rid of them in that way. That's really what he's saying here. You can't just get rid of them by suppression. You can't make awakening happening through an act of will. There is a different way to the path of awakening here. And this is a very important insight uh, because it means that we, instead of using willpower in our meditation, of course Ajahn Brahm is the one who always talks about not using willpower, uh, and uh, this is a good basis for that in the suttas, uh, that actually instead of using willpower we use wisdom instead to guide our mind. Uh, and this, if you think back of what the Buddha has been doing so far, the Buddha-to-be has done so far, he has been using wisdom. Uh, yeah, he has been seeing the danger uh, in, in death and birth and all that, this is kind of the first, it's like wisdom, yeah, you see the danger, that means seeing wisdom is not willpower. Then he sees the danger in sensuality, that is more wisdom. So he's using wisdom to turn away from the dangers of the world and move the mind in the right direction. So that is what he has been doing. And now, at the very end, he's trying to use willpower again to kind of gain the last release. Yeah? And this is where he goes wrong. Willpower is not really the path. Sometimes we may need to use a little bit of willpower, but most of the time, if we can, we use wisdom power and we try to be smart and, and uh, wise about how we use our minds rather than uh, willing things into existence. Uh, what is interesting about this little passage here, I don't know if you re some of you may recognize it, uh, but this passage right here is the same passage you find in the sutta called the Vitaka Santana Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 20. Vitaka Santana means the calming of thoughts. Yeah, this is Majjhima Nikaya 20, 
And it shows you five ways of calming the thinking mind. This is what that sutta shows you. It's a very beautiful sutta, and I, uh, I, I, like, I often do it on a meditation retreats and that sort of thing. Uh, I won't be doing it this year. And the five ways of calming the mind, uh, they are like hierarchical. It starts off with uh, using uh, substitution as a kind of way of using wisdom power. Uh, and then it goes through five ways. And the last of those five ways of calming the thinking mind is this way. Yeah, it's almost verbatim, exactly the same as this way, uh, which is kind of interesting. Right? So it, because it makes you wonder, on the one hand, the Buddha says, well, actually, this doesn't work, yeah? it's the wrong way. On the other hand, it's in the Sutta, where it says this is the path to overcoming the thought, the bad thoughts. So what is it? Is it against the Dhamma, or is it, f is it in, in accordance with the Dhamma? It kind of makes you confused. Yeah? Should we do this, or should we not do this? And the answer is, I think, that here, this is given as a path in its own right to awakening. Yeah? Yeah, this is he's using this to try to reach awakening here. But actually in the Vitaka Santana Sutta, it is only one out of five ways to overcome unwholesome thoughts. Yeah? And it is not only not only is it just one out of five ways, it is only a way to overcome uh, or unwholesome thoughts. And then beyond that, you have to do samasati, satipatthana practice, and then samasamadhi as well. And only then is awakening possible. So in the suttas, it's only a tiny bit of the path. Yeah? Here, it is the entire path in its own right. And that is the difference. Another important difference is that in the uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta, where you find this passage, it is only the last of five ways. And if you uh, know how the Dhamma works, the Dhamma is always hierarchical. It is always has a certain sequence in things. So if it is the fifth out of five ways, it means it is the least important one. It is the very last one you should do if all else fails. That's what it means. So we start with using wisdom, yeah? and then we use the other techniques there, which is like forgetting the bad thoughts, and then allowing them to calm down by themselves. And eventually, if everything fails, and you are about to murder somebody, okay, then suppress. Yeah? I, I must not kill this person. Okay, suppress, suppress, suppress. Then you use willpower. Huh? You know what I mean? Sometimes we are about to do something bad. We know we shouldn't do it, but it was almost, I, we can't stop ourselves. The wisdom is completely in turmoil. We have lost all our wisdom. I, sh I must not do this. How, what can I do? Okay, suppress. Yeah? Don't, this is the right, I must not lie. Okay, suppress that, that idea of lying, or whatever it is. Yeah? This is wrong. I, I'm going to go in the wrong way. Sometimes suppression is right, but it should be used with great care because uh, otherwise it can cause so much troubles as well, psychological troubles. Yeah? If you go on suppressing your inner life all the time, it leads to, after a while you start to go a bit crazy because you're suppressing everything. Yeah? And it's not, uh, not a nice thing at all. Uh. So uh, this is the first one. Yeah? The Buddha, he calls it self-torment. Using too much willpower is self-torment. So then he gives that up because all it leads to is being exhausted. And because you are exhausted, you are uncalm. And if you are uncalm, there is no way you can gain real samadhi and peace inside. And for that reason, you won't be able to see anything here. Uh, at the same time, the, the Buddha-to-be, he is very, obviously very, he has a very well-developed mind. So because of that, he does not those painful feelings, they do not remain, invade the mind and remain, uh, which means that he, uh, he is able to let go of these things very quickly. They don't actually become a mental obstacle for him, which it might do for most people if you did this kind of practices. Uh, so then he, then he says, I thought, suppose I practice the breathing-less meditation, a panaka jhana. A panaka means the jhana without breath. And uh, this is one of the few places where the word jhana is used in a kind of pre-Buddhist way. Uh, and here it refers to a particular kind of uh, breath control. Uh, got nothing to do with jhanas as it means, as it is used later on to mean the samma samadhi. Here it means uh, br uh, uh, breath control exercise. That's really all it means here. Uh, so uh, again, the word jhana. Uh, is used by the Buddha is a pre-existing word in the Indian culture, uh, and the Buddha takes it to mean a specific uh, types of meditation practice later on. Uh. So I pra practice the breathingless meditation. Suppose I stop the in-breaths and the out-breaths through my mouth and nose. 
While I did so, there was a loud sound of winds coming out from my ear holes. Just as there is a loud sound when the smith's bellows are blown, so too, while I, uh, sup while I stopped the inbreaths and the outbreaths through my nose and ears, there was a loud sound of winds coming out from my ear holes. So he basically starting breathing through his ears. That's what it, what it means. <laughs> it's not, not a very good idea, is it? <laughs> You can imagine this being pretty painful. <laughs> but although a tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, uh, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feelings that arose in, in me did not invade my mind and remain. It's kind of astonishing how determined he is. Yeah, he really is determined on kind of finding a path. He is willing to take things to the absolute extreme. How many people would be willing to do this kind of stuff? You know, it's just, uh, it's really. Uh, so this is why people get a bit impressed by, um, you know, by ascetic practices or by self-torment. They are impressed by this because when you read these kind of things, it is uh, it's almost superhuman to be able to do these things. And yet the Buddha does not call this superhuman. To the Buddha, the real superhuman is the insights that you have that lead to an end of all suffering. That is the real superhuman aspects in Buddhism. So although these things sound very impressive, and, and because they sound so impressive, uh, have you seen the statue of the Buddha where the Buddha is really emaciated? Uh, have, you, have, you got that, is that, have you got that here in the in BF, BGF? No, haven't got it here, okay. So is, that, is that because you are especially wise here at the BGF? <laughs> so what was that? You have your food. You love your food, okay, if you see that it t turns you off your food. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, so, and what is interesting about that is, that the, I think the reason why people have, and or why organizations we have this statue of the Buddha, or the Buddha to be, is because we are impressed by ascetic practices. Yeah, we think, wow, this is amazing. How could you do this? But actually, the Buddha says it's the wrong path. So when you are have that statue of the Buddha to be, and you kind of sometimes you people bow down to that, you actually what we're doing, we're bowing down to wrong view. Is that a good idea to bow down to wrong view? It's a bad idea, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and this, I think, so I think this is not such a good idea. We can remind ourselves of this that you know the, the Buddha did these things, and it's good to know that. But actually, we should remind ourselves that when the Buddha did this, uh, he says later on, this was wrong view. He was on the wrong path while he was doing this. Uh, his striving was admirable, and he really took these things to the end. But this is not actually what the Buddha probably would want us to bow down to, uh, because it is the wrong path, it's the wrong way. Uh. So uh, it's good to keep that in mind, and I, I think sometimes we, uh, and this is one of the reasons uh, people are really impressed by ascetic practices, uh, and uh, you, uh, and, and that is one of the reasons why it is very easy to get uh, taken taken by these things and and start to be impressed by other people who practice very austerely and ascetically. Uh, but sometimes those people who are very austere and ascetic, they have actually lost the middle path and they have gone down the path that actually is wrong, where there's too much self torment and it stops them from uh, reaching awakening. Uh, whether that is by sitting in postures for too long with enormous pain or whatever else it is, sometimes these things are very counterproductive because you can't really relax. You can't be sabai. Breathe in, sabai. Oh, no, breathe in, pain. Yeah. Oh, I can't bear this any longer. Yeah, that's what people often do, and this is problematic. Yeah. So, uh, let, let us move on. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stop the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears. <laughs> While I did so, vi violent winds cut through my head, just as if a strong man were to crush my head with the tip of a sharp sword. So too, while I stop the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears, Violent winds cut through my head, but all the tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feelings that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. 
I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breaths, out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, there was a violent pains in my head. Uh, just as if a strong man were tightening a tough leather, leather strap around my head as a headband, so too, when I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears, there were violent pains in my head. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and uncalm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feelings that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I thought, suppose I practice, the f practice further the breathingless meditation. So I stopped the in-breath and out-breath through my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, violent winds carved up my belly, just as if a skilled butcher or his apprentice were to carve up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. So too, while I stopped the in-breath and out-breath through my mouth, nose and ears, violent winds carved up my belly. But although tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established, my body was overwrought and calm because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feelings that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. I thought, suppose I practice further the breathingless meditation. Jeepers, you're really going for it. It's not <laughs> So I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears. While I did so, there was a violent burning in my body. Just as if two strong men were to seize a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pit of hot coals. <laughs> so too, while I stopped the in-breaths and out-breaths through my mouth, nose and ears, there was a violent burning in my body. But all those tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was overwrought and uncalm, because I was exhausted by the painful striving. But such painful feelings that arose in me did not invade my mind and remain. So, uh, uh, there is, so I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what this breathless meditation is all about. It's kind of a little bit strange. You stop your breathing uh, and uh, you, to see what happens. I, uh, I'm not 100% sure what it is, but I, the point of this probably is that somehow you're trying to go beyond the body and find some kind of higher spiritual reality by suppressing the body completely. That's probably what this is about, you know, in, in a certain way. Uh, because uh, the spiritual existence must somehow lie beyond the body. And by controlling the body completely in this way, stopping the breath and all of that, uh, it's almost like you're trying to get rid of the body somehow, and then f through that move to some higher reality. I think that is a lot of the logic behind all the ascetic practices and the Atta Kilamitanu Yoga that you found in India at that time uh, was that the body was considered the problem and you wanted to release that body. You did it by, uh, uh, by uh, using all these painful practices that then would like counteract the normal bodily impulses and then somehow get rid of the body in that way. Uh, it's very interesting, you look at the history of uh, spiritual practices in the whole world uh, and it's a very common thing, this idea of subjecting the body to pain. Yeah? It is, this has happened in Christianity, in Islam apparently, it certainly happens in Hinduism. In fact all of these practices we're seeing now are really uh, proto-Hindu practices, part of the Brahminic, Brahmanical culture at the time. So all of these things seem to be very deeply ingrained in human psychology. Yeah, The idea that you overcome the body by torturing it in a certain way. Yeah. So uh, th that is probably what the Buddha-to-be uh, is trying to do here. And then he takes it to really extremes, yeah, to the extreme that you probably can't take it any further. If you took it any further, you probably would die from these things. Uh, and uh, so he, he doesn't do that. Uh, fortunately for us, otherwise we wouldn't be here today uh, if he had taken it even further. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then what happens is now when the deities saw me, some said, the Rikris Gautama is dead. 
Others later said, well, if he didn't breathe, we can see why they thought he might be dead. Other data said the reckless Gautama is not dead, he is dying. And other deities said the reckless Gautama is not dead nor dying, he's an arahant. For such is the way the arahants abide. So they were all pretty confused, yeah? They had no idea what was going on. Maybe he's dead or he's an arahant, you know? It's kind of uh, very opposite ends of the spectrum a little bit. And uh, so it shows you that the deities, again, they don't really have any wisdom. They didn't know what was going on. Yeah? The deities are part of samsara just like us, and they're trying to find their way out of problems and their own uh, heavenly sufferings. Maybe not so bad, but a little bit of heavenly suffering probably they had as well. Uh, so the deities are really confused about what is going on here. And it just shows you that the Buddha uh, took these things to such an extreme that people didn't really know what was going on anymore. It was just all getting very, very confusing and uncertain. Huh? So then the Buddha goes on to his next kind of ascetic practice. This is the last of the three kinds. Uh, so one is the uh, the mind control, the other one is breath control, and the last one is food control, is the last one. I thought, suppose I practice entirely cutting off food. Then the deities came to me and said, good sir, do not practice entirely cutting off food. If you do so, we shall infuse heavenly food into the pores of your skin, and you will live on that. <laughs> I considered if I claim to be completely fasting while these deities infuse heavenly food into pores of my skin and I live on that, then I shall be lying. So I dismissed those deities, saying there is no need. So uh, it's kind of a strange little thing, isn't it? Uh, what, what is this all about? Uh, heavenly deities infusing, could, could they really do that? Uh, is that really possible? Uh, and. Uh, I, I don't know, and uh, I think it's, it, to me it sounds a bit over the top, but maybe the point may simply be that the Buddha really is cutting off food. Yeah? He's not messing around, he's not kind of pretending to do it while uh, actually doing it a little bit. He is cutting it off fully. It may simply be to make a very clear point about that. Uh, that may be the main uh, position of, on this. Uh, I haven't checked this against the uh, other versions of this particular passage, I'm not sure if there is another version in the Chinese arguments uh, of this, uh, because as I said before, there is a, a strange anomaly because of the various schools in the Chinese arguments. Uh, uh, but it's not, I don't think it's so important. The main point is simply that the Buddha is not messing around. Uh, I thought, suppose I take very little food, a handful each time, whether of bean soup or lentil soup or veg soup or pea soup. So I took very little food, a handful each time, whether of bean soup or lentil soup or veg soup or pea soup. While I did so, my body reached a state of extreme emaciation. Because of eating so little, my limbs became like the jointed segments on vine stems or bamboo stems. Because of eating so little, my backside became like a camel's hoof. Because of eating so little, the projections on my spine stood forth like corded beads. Because of eating so little, my ribs jutted out as gaunt as crazy rafters of an old roofless barn. Yeah, if you look at that famous, as I mentioned before, that statue of the Buddha, that's exactly what that uh, to Buddha to be looks like. Yeah, you, you see all the ribs, and that's exactly, it comes from this description here. That's where that statue is made from. Uh. Because of eating so little, the gleam of my eyes sank far down in the sockets, uh, looking like the gleam of water that had sunk far down in a deep well. Because of eating so little, my scalp shriveled and withered as a green, bitter gourd shrivels and withers in the wind and sun. Because of eating so little, my belly skin adhered to my backbone. Thus, if I touched my belly, I encountered my backbone. And if I touched my backbone, I encountered my belly skin. Gee, that sounds really over the top. <laughs> Because I was eating so little, if I defecated and urinated, I fell over on my face right there. Would you, <laughs> anyway, because of eating... <laughs> 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 
Because of eating so little, if I try to ease my body by rubbing with my limbs, with my hands, the hair rotted at its roots, fell from my body as I rubbed. So this is, so he, yeah, so this is very extreme, isn't it? Uh, yeah, really, really extreme. And uh, of course, he must be very close to dying. And that's actually what he says next here. He takes these ascetic practices to the very uh, highest possible point uh, and uh, can't really go any further. Now when people saw me, some said, the recluse Gautama is black. Other people said, the recluse Gautama is not black, he is brown. Other people said, the recluse Gautama is neither black nor brown, he is golden skinned. So much had the clear, bright color of my skin deteriorated through eating so little. So, um, okay. So that is the uh, uh, ascetic practices. And to just to summarize them, then uh, the Buddha says, I thought uh, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past have experienced painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. And whatever recluses and Brahmas at present experience painful, racking, piercing feelings due to exertion, this is the utmost. There is none beyond this. But by this racking practice of austerities, I have not attained any superhuman qualities and a distinction in knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones. Could there be another path to awakening here? So, uh, the Buddha has taken his experimentation with uh, uh, tor self-torment to the absolute extreme. He has uh, uh, stopped eating again, presumably to kind of uh, uh, reduce the body to uh, as not uh, nothing as possible to see if the body somehow can be overcome by not eating. Uh, and uh, he is on the verge of death. And of course, dying is not very useful. It's not going to. It's not going to solve the issue. Uh, and uh, but he hasn't got. And he hasn't actually achieved anything. Uh, the austerities didn't work. Uh, yeah. So now he has found out sens sensual pleasure doesn't work. Uh, austerities. Okay. Just, just one second. I'll get back to you. Uh, austerities don't don't work. Uh, and neither of these things. These are the two extremes uh, in a sense. Uh, they don't work. So because they don't work, then he asks himself, yeah, he has taken both of those to extremes. He lived a very sensual life as a layperson. Now he lives the exact opposite as an ascetic. He has tried those fully. Now the question is, is there another way to awakening if these things don't work? Yeah. Okay. Ajahn Brahm, I, I do agree um, that self torment is not the right way. Yeah. But only this way, I mean, he says here that Buddha said that painful feelings can't invade my mind. Yeah. But only through this self torment or this kind of experience, he kind of get to experience that yeah. my mind can't be invaded by these painful feelings. Yeah. So in that sense, um, certain level of um, suffering is needed in, in our practice to, to kind of experience that you know, this yeah. kind of thing really can't invade my mind? Um, I, I think, uh, I, yeah, I, I think the, so your question, you, I, I understand your question. You need to practice in this way to find out that your mind is not invaded by painful feelings. Uh, but actually you don't need to do that, you see here. Uh, this is kind of the nice thing here. Uh, you don't actually have to, f to find this thing out. Uh, uh, because if you're, uh, uh, be, and, and the reason is, and if you read things like the Anapanasati Sutta, uh, it says that you start off with watching the breath, then you have the happy feelings coming from the breath, and there is no need, according to that sutta, anywhere to experience the painful feelings, because you transcend those painful feelings through the happy feelings. All you need is the happy feelings, and the painful feelings, they just disappear, and because they disappear, you have an already an understanding of those, you gain an insight through their disappearance.
The most powerful insights you can have in, into anything is when it disappears. Uh, because when it disappears, you know, it is anicca, fully anicca. Uh, it is also dukkha, because when it's gone, it is hap you're happier. And also it's non-self, because you're, it, it, uh, you're not controlling it anymore, it's out of control. Uh, so you gain insight into the painful feelings through their disappearance, rather than through experiencing them in this way. You don't actually need that. Uh, so uh, you... Um, uh, um, of course, if the painful feelings do invade your mind, it is very problematic, and that's when you cannot meditate anymore. Yeah, you meditate, and you have pains in your legs and your knees or whatever, and all of that, uh, and you're not actually making any uh, progress because of the pain. So instead of actually using that and, uh, and then trying not to be affected by those things, that, which is probably part of what they do in the Gwenka technique, uh, where you sit down for an hour and a half, you have pains, and if you say, oh, I've got so much pain, okay, just watch it, uh, yeah? And maybe it is possible to overcome the pain, for some people at least, through that way, if you have your mindfulness. But I think a far more powerful way is just not to get into that at all. Because get instead into a place where the body becomes insignificant, because the body is really what you want to get rid of in all of this. Yeah, The Buddha also is trying to get rid of the body here in a certain way. The body is the problem. So you abandon the pleasure and the pain altogether, the body becomes irrelevant, and that is actually where you find the peace of mind as a consequence. Just that probability of experiencing uh, disappearing is yeah. I mean, uh, seems to be quite quite you know distance <laughs> from my level. I'm for, for my own. I'm speaking for my my own. Yeah. So then, in that sense, I mean, yeah. Just that because just because the probability is so low, yeah. um, going through certain level of suffering or actually. Um, you know, sitting, for example, for two hours on the floor and going through that pain and overcoming that pain, yeah. would that be a bit helpful? Or? I don't think so. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it is helpful at all. I think it is just an obstacle. Uh, because you, uh, a lot of the time you are engulfed in the pain. The pain is just too much. Uh, you can't deal with it properly. All you're doing is enduring rather than actually being able to see it clearly. A lot of it is endurance. Uh, and uh, there is no evidence in the sutta that this is required. Uh, yeah, the Buddha doesn't say it anywhere. Uh, rather than doing that, it is much more uh, useful to have a sense of peace in the body. That is where it's far more likely to find the joy and happiness in meditation, if you have a sense of ease and you are relaxed about things. Uh, so if you don't get that happiness in your meditation practice, it is not because you haven't had enough insight into pain. Uh, the reason is different. The Buddha doesn't say that's the reason. The reason the Buddha says you haven't got enough happiness in your meditation is because you haven't purified your sila enough yet. That's the reason. It is a message again and again in the suttas. If you look at what the Buddha calls the, um, he's called the um, uh, uh, dependent Liberation, yeah, there's a sequence of dependent liberation that the Buddha talks about in a number of places in the suttas. Uh, and he starts off by saying, first of all, you have the virtue. Uh, from the virtue, the sila, you have the non-remorse. Uh, from the non-remorse, you have pamudra, which is gladness. Uh, from the gladness, you have the piti. From the piti, you have tranquility. From the tranquility, you have the sukkha. From the sukkha, you have samadhi. From the samadhi, you have yatabhut and anadasana. That's when you see things according to reality. Uh, and there's nowhere in that sequence that any pain is actually required. Uh, if you don't get the pamudja, if you don't get the gladness, you have to ask yourself, can I purify my sila even more? Uh, that's the question you should ask yourself. Uh, yeah? And uh, remember, sila is very profound in Buddhism. It is also about your mental states. Uh, it is about how much metta you have, how much compassion you have. Uh, yeah? So develop th those sides. Uh, and as you develop those, uh, you change the way you think about things, you change the way you perceive other people, and also yourself and the world around you, then it is likely that those happiness will ha have come in your meditation. You can bypass all the pain, uh, go straight to the happiness. Uh. If you, f if you find that you are having success with a meditation that has pain, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Uh, yeah? If you feel that it is worthwhile uh, and you're getting something out of it, uh, then uh, I, you know, I, who, I'm not, I, I can't tell you you shouldn't be doing these things. Uh, so please, please do so. But I would uh, encourage, in the, in the end, the point is to gain the happiness that actually takes you to samadhi. Yeah? You want to go through that as well. Uh, you want to make that part of your path. Uh. Not 
by their own choice. Yeah. So it seems to me that it helped them to actually obtain certain level of state. So many, yeah. you know, this kind of suffering does help in one's life. Uh, you're saying that suffering can be helpful because many masters have kind of gone through suffering uh, in the life, and it, it can be, but suffering comes anyway. Yeah, you get suffering anyway, and you don't have to create additional suffering. I, I, even as a monk, I have plenty of enough suffering in my life. I don't need to, <laughs> to make, make any more, su more suffering in my life. You know, it's not as if everything is just a breeze and always pure happiness. And, and so uh, it, it is more about whatever suffering you have, use that wisely. And if you use the suffering in your life wisely, then it becomes very useful. Uh, and, and that's what I do whenever I feel I have a problem with other people. There's always problems with people. Yeah? This, is kind of, this is a lot of what life is about. Uh, but you deal with that situation in a wise and skillful way, and you come out much wiser at the other end. You learn to look at the other person with compassion, with understanding, with metta. Use the difficulties in life. Already, already there's enough pain in the body as well, yeah, sometimes. Use whatever pain you have wisely, then it becomes useful. But I don't think it's necessary to create additional pain. Uh, that is really what I... Anyway, that's the way it seems to me. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and I cannot see much reason in the suttas for believing that. The only reason we in the suttas is that you have the Satipatthana Sutta. In the Vedana Nupasana, the Buddha lists all the Vedanas, and one of the Vedanas he lists there is the Sam Samisa uh, Dukkha Vedana, which is like the uh, carnal, painful feeling. That's the kind of thing you feel when you sit you know, too long in one position. You feel the carnal or physical painful feeling, if you like. It's listed there, and it, you should understand it, he says, but it doesn't really say that you should deliberately try to you know, uh, make these kind of feelings. Uh, yeah. Wrong, I have to say. I yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. Please, okay, now do, do whatever works for you. If you feel it works for you, do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't do it, but uh, just um, uh, you know, reflect on your, on your, um, on, on your um, situation, on the meditation, and, tr and, and learn from it wisely, and uh, see if you can, uh, you know, whatever makes you progress is the important thing. As long as you reflect on it, and you are careful with it, and you do it wisely, then that shouldn't be a problem. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, oh, so, so time, time, yes, I think you're right. So we have just come to this uh, very exciting point uh, about all the painful, uh, all the austerities have been completed and the Buddha asked these questions, could there be another path to awakening here? Yeah, it is just getting really exciting and we have to call it a day. So I, uh, not call it a day, rather call it, call it get ready for lunch. Uh, so we, it's, like, it's like one of those movies, yeah, they stop just at the right time and bang, you, know, you have to wait one week to get the next episode, yeah, that's kind of, this is that kind of thing. So anyway, this is just to make sure you come back after the meal, yeah, so have, have a nice meal and we'll see you again at around 1.30 here. Yeah.